Welcome back to the Triggered Newscast. Today is March 13th, 2019, and I just wanted to provide all of you with the audio of Ruth Bader Ginsburg during the oral arguments this past February. So, an interesting note before we get started, the website, which is down in the description, so is every link to every PDF, every audio file. Again, just look down in the description. I notated the times that she spoke, but if you don't want to go through all that hassle, I outlined every single thing she said in the following video, and I also included what was said right leading up to what she says and right after in response, and a few interesting times where she's mentioned. So I do notice some weird breaks. It does seem like this could be old footage that's spliced in, but it is written down in the minutes and the testimony online, and in some of the cases it does sound like a very genuine exchange. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. I'm going to really dig through it again tomorrow maybe analyze it a little better. But uh, for now, I just wanted to get this out there for you. So go ahead and take a look. The real process could then be protected from having to go back and relitigate in court, in district court or the International Trade Commission. Your position is that it's the estoppel provision is the linchpin, you just said. But your position would be the same even if there were no estoppel provision. Is that not so? That is correct, Your Honor. Then you have to come to 1498 and um, recover compensation from them. So but it's why, a very. Why would, why would the government? Why, why would Congress want to leave a government agency out of this second look? If the idea is to weed out uh, patents that never should have been. Um, given in the first place? Because the government already has opportunities through both the re-examination and through of proving invalidity by clearing convincing evidence. And if they can get before the PTO, they will have a de novo standard of review. They'll be before the expert agency. They perceive that their chances of establishing invalidity will be greater. It's not — and that is particularly — integral to the CBM review scheme, which, as Ms. Brinkman was pointing out, is limited by statute to people who have been sued for or charged with infringement. It what is does charged with mean? I'm sorry? What does charged with mean? Charged with is — it basically means you've received a cease and desist letter. You have been — that the likelihood of, a, of, of an infringement suit against you is sufficiently real and immediate that you would satisfy the standards of a declaratory judgment. It's what about Ms. Brinkman's — linchpin, that the estoppel provision, that the government effectively gets two bites of the apple, everybody else gets just one. I, I think we can be estopped in subsequent PTO — we would still be subject to common law estoppel, that the primary difference between the two is that for IPR purposes, statutory estoppel encompasses arguments that could have been made but weren't, whereas common law estoppel encompasses only arguments that were actually made. By common law estoppel, what do you mean? You mean issue preclusion? Issue preclusion, that's correct. And what, and would, what would you tell me? Performance obligations. Um, Congress never thought that rejection would enable the estate to take back rights already conveyed to the licensee. Could one say it didn't? Congress never thought that rejection would enable the estate to take back rights already conveyed to the licensee. Could one say it didn't take any position on Lubrizol one way or another in the trademark context? It did, quite specifically in the patent context. But it didn't either approve or disapprove. One could say that, Justice Ginsburg. Um, I, I believe the reason that Congress didn't include trademarks in 365N is because 365H1 only applies to lessees where the lease has commenced. So in other words, the party whose lease has commenced, which is the party that would have a particular claim on Congress's interest, has lesser rights than a lessee whose lease has not yet commenced. Can we if you've go not back and see, I, is there any disagreement between you and the other side about what would happen outside bankruptcy. And as we're told, outside bankruptcy, one party's rejection 
doesn't terminate the rights of the opposing party. That, that's right, Your Honor. The, the, outs, the non-bankruptcy rule is that the counterparty has the choice. Licensees, rather, patent licensees, because they were a favored party, and that in the end, those are fewer and lesser than the rights of trademark owners or that patent licensees would have had had there been no exception at all. How do you explain that the scholars in this field, the bankruptcy field, uh, disagree with your interpretation and they say Lubrizol was wrong and Sunbeam was right? Well, Your Honor, it's not a uniform view. We've pointed to articles that agree with us, uh, the Peter Menel are with the City of New York with regard to the challenged conduct. Um, and m and does not perform a function that has traditionally and exclusively been carried out by the City of New York. But well, you say m and was engaged uh, by the City uh, to administer a scheme that was determined by State and City law that is to afford access on a first-come, first-served basis, giving m and no independent judgment about what will air or when it will air. So it seems that m and is an administrator of a city-state policy, this first-come, first-serve. And unlike other arrangements, it has no independent decision-making authority. Respectfully, Justice Ginsburg, um, that's not quite correct. The uh, grant agreement under which court is whether there's really some difference between reimprisonment under 3583E3 and Section 3583K. And there really isn't any difference between those two. Well, what if about the fact that without finding that he committed a violation of 3583K, without that, the min- minimum term of imprisonment, the minimum term would be zero years. But with that factual finding, it becomes five years. Well, let me, let me say a, a few things about that. Uh, first of all, the court held in more could do process problems, and they also create tremendous uh, problems with regard to the right to a jury trial. What about the government's argument that you are conceding that revocation and re-imprisonment under E3 is okay? The, the uh, E3 reads that uh, the court may revoke a defendant's uh, supervised release to allow him to serve in prison all or part of the term of supervised release, period of incarceration that was authorized by the jury's verdict. That would be how you would deal with that situation, I think. And how long could the contempt penalty be? Well, if you're dealing with contempt, there are rules under this court's uh, holding in bloom that if you're looking in that situation, that has to be presented by the jury if that's going to cause him to have uh, a mandatory minimum three years. What do you think of the government's proposal as a fallback that rather than strike down the, the statute, you convene a jury and have the jury make the finding. There are two responses. First of all, it's just a simple ant- question as to why you need to do it at all, which is what they really want to do. So your uh, question is, who would be the prosecutor, for example? Uh, well, you have the issue as to whether or not if you allowed a you did get a benefit from that pretrial and official mm-hmm. detention. Yes. It was treated as if it were part of the sentence. In Ohio, what happens when a defendant is sentenced is that the official detention time and granted custody credits, those custody credits are not the same ism. They're not the same being as a term of imprisonment. They're handled separately. The person is in prison. He's not at liberty. And he is given credit for that time against the sentence of conviction. I really don't follow what you seem to be saying. Uh, It is not imprisonment, even though the the court sentence treats it as it is imprisonment for the conviction. This is this is what I am trying to say, Justice Ginsburg. 
when a person is sentenced to, we'll take Mr. Chief Justice's argument and five years. Thereby. As Justice Ginsburg, as the Justice, oh my, now I've done it. If as Justice Kagan has just said to you, there is ambiguity. Generally treats pretrial detention as triggering tolling that they are is in jail. He is under the supervision of the jailing facility. He is subject which, which may to the be restri- different than the than the uh, supervised release could be in, in in one jurisdiction and the person is being held in detention someplace else. So does that th- does the um, probation officer have access to that other? jurisdiction of jail? It's, it's a very awkward situation, Your Honor. In, in this case, we had a defendant who is in state jail probably get credit for that pre-sentencing but detention. Can we just back up and explain how we get into this mess and why we need tolling? Uh, how does supervised release work? That is, in, 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 in this case, uh, the defendant failed to drug tests while he was on supervised release? Nothing was done. He submitted another substance. Um, Nothing was done about that. He was first charged with a marijuana offense in state court. Nothing was done about that. At what point does the judge blow the whistle on the supervised release? That's a matter for the, for the, the, the sentencing judge has to, the judge, the federal judge, to make a determination before that if they chose to, but many of the judges want to wait and see what happens. And that's totally up to the individual judge. There are no guidelines for when uh, the um, least person has done something that warrants putting him back in prison? There are guidelines, and I, th- I think when in, in a case like this one where the defendant has violated criminal law. With respect to any conflict, but it would have to but look but like Mr. this Mr. Cashel, what about not a wor- world war or any war memorial, but a memorial to a tragic event? Let's say a mass shooting at a school. Could the local community then decide it wants to put up a cross in front of that school to honor the children and the teachers who died in the mass shooting. Well, I think the test, Justice G- Ginsburg, would be whether there is an independent secular purpose. So take a real be permissible because it has independent historic value and independent secular value, showing values of resilience my, and my courage. My example was nothing that was found in the rubble. It's just the local community decides it wants to honor the dead in this terrible tragedy. Right. The test would be whether or not there's an independent secular purpose. I don't think you could probably hearken back to the same tradition that you could with respect to, for example, these World War I crosses, well, Sea of Flanders. The purpose is to honor those who died in the tragedy. Yes. So, yes yeah, or so no, could you? But I don't think purpose is what this Court's decisions turn on. Van Orda and the Buono plurality say that it's sorry, objective I, meaning. I thought you just said that the test is whether there's a secular purpose. So well, but it would that be is, okay, then? It would be okay to put up in front of the public? Well, I think we need to know more about the facts of that particular hypothetical. Well, here's stuff make this a very easy case, and we don't think you need to go further than in, this. In the field of Flanders, are all of the graves marked by crosses? Are they not graves mocked by stars of David? There certainly are some, but I think the dominant image of the time, everything from that poem to art to the war bond advertisements that the United States government put to the 1924 congressional resolution, all did use this cross. And that's why we agree, Justice I've Ginsburg. i some of those battlefields, and there are stars of David mocking the graves oh. of Jewish Quite, soldiers. quite true. We're, we're not disagreeing with that. We're just saying that here, and this is what the Buono hostilization are much less than in the communal prayer. Mr. Co- Colvin, could you explain? You, know, you have this coercion uh, theory that you think you're urging us to adopt. But if that's what the Establishment Clause prohibits, only coercion, how does its offer, how does its office differ from the free exercise clause? That is, can you suggest a practice that would be 
unconstitutionally coercive under the Establishment Clause and yet be inoffensive under the Free Exercise Clause? Yes, Your Honor, forcing us to pay three pence to a minister. That would violate my memorials since the post-Civil War generation, the one that incorporated — The change from the founding, this was uh, an almost uh, an overwhelmingly Christian country. But now we're told that 30 percent of the U.S. population does not adhere to a Christian faith. Does, does that change make any difference? I don't think it affects whether the cross took on in the wake of the Great War. Welcome back to the Triggered Newscast. Today, 